Jambo bwana habari gani nzuri sana wageni mwakaribishwa Kenya yetu hakuna matata A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, first of all, would love to welcome you all onto this amazing Zoom session that we have that has been hosted by the Lohana community of Nairobi. The Lohana Youth League uh, have kindly hosted this uh, Zoom session with uh, the none other than our Lord Dollar Popat. So before we start, I would like to say a global welcome. This particular Zoom session is actually being aired on Zoom, on Facebook and other social media platforms so that the benefit of this session can be gained by all the individuals globally. So before we start, a happy Independence Day for India to all the viewers today. 15th of August, the day to remember. So on behalf of the Lohana Youth League, Nairobi, I'm truly delighted to be the MC for this session. My name is Dr. Lalit Soda. And today we have many, many dignitaries who are joined in, who will be joining in through the session for this very, very informative and understanding session for us as Lohanas, as uh, Indians, as British subjects, and as also good human beings. Some good points are being shared and some amazing information will also be delivered by Lord Popat. It is going to be my amazing great privilege to be introducing a man of such high caliber. A man who is fueled by his tenacious entrepreneurial spirit, a sharp talent for finance, and an unparalleled drive for success. None other than our Lord Poppet. Ladies and gentlemen, and the global <laughs> audience we have today, I would like to present Lord Poppet to you all in just a couple minutes. Before Lord Poppet takes over, we have a few formalities that we will be starting with. A warm welcome by Dr. Deep Bayani from the Lohana Youth League Nairobi. Thereafter, a welcome by our none other than Mrs. Mina Ben Kagram from Nakuru, um, who will who is actually currently hosting this session on Zoom. And a, she is a philanthropic lady who is trying to spread love, peace, and unity globally. So before they come on, sorry, before they come on, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker to you. Minaben, if we can have a spotlight thrown on to Lord Dollar Poppet, if you may, please, or we can do it as a speaker's view. That would also be helpful. Minaben, could you please, or Ali, could you handle that? Yeah. yeah, it is done. Okay, thank you very much. So Lord Poppet, uh, a gentleman today, we are honored to welcome him. 
as our guest speaker for this virtual meeting. By the way of background, Lord Poppet was born in Uganda in a, as a conservative peer in the United <laughs> Kingdom who was appointed to the House of Lords by the former minister, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron in July 2010 for his services to small businesses. This month, he will be celebrating 10 years of becoming a member of the Houses of Lords. Lord Poppet is a lifelong conservative and was the first Gujarati to represent the Conservative Party in the House of Lords in the mother of all parliaments as the Minister of the Crown for Business and Transport. As part of his ministerial duties, Lord Poppet was also a Lord in waiting and he was the only British Indian member of the Royal Household. This involved carrying out a number of royal duties such as receiving heads of state on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen. Lord Poppet has worked for the Conservative Party for the last 45 years, helping to bridge the gap between the Conservative Party and the British Indian community. Serving five prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher, John Major, David Cameron, Theresa May, and now Boris Johnson. Lord Poppet is currently the prime minister's trade envoy to Rwanda and Uganda, the country of his birth. He considers himself as the child of Africa and is passionate about exporting and is using his role to strengthen bilateral trade ties with the region. Over the last two years, Lord Poppet has doubled UK trade with Rwanda and trade with Uganda has gone up by fold. <laughs> Lord Poppet's main areas of interest in the Lords are Commonwealth and Africa, as well as supporting small and medium-sized businesses, especially <laughs> helping them to export more. Last year, Lord Poppet launched his book, A British Subject, which I know many members have read, and this is the book I mean, an amazing book everybody should have. It is universal tale that I'm sure many of us can relate to. Having come to the United Kingdom as a refugee in 1971, after being expelled by the brutal dictatorship of Idi Amin, the book follows his journey on how he established himself in the United Kingdom. Lord Poppet is a patriotic British man, a Gujarati and a Lohana. He first coined the term proud to be British, proud to be a Hindu, and for the Hindu Forum of Britain. Lord Poppet has been a community leader for over 40 years and served under the chairmanship of my late father, Mr. Ambratla Soda, where he helped him attain planning permission for the Raghuvanshi Charitable Trust. Lord Poppet was recently commissioned by the Lohana community to undergo a report for them to explore what steps they can take to do better to serve their aging population. The report took Lord Poppet over 18 months to write after taking evidence from 120 people, over 120 people and organizations including the Jewish and the Ismaili communities. The challenges and solutions are not limited to the Lohana community and relevant to us all. The report comes at a timely moment and we look forward to hearing from Lord Poppet. He is also very passionate about <coughs> empowering the new generation of the British born Indians to get involved in the civic duty whether it is becoming MPs, councillors, or becoming school governors or magistrates. It is a great privilege to have Lord Poppet with us this afternoon in London, this evening in India, and a later <laughs> afternoon in the Kenyan subcontinent. 
So we are very grateful for to Lord Poppet for him accepting our invitation, and we look forward to hearing from Lord Poppet. Above all, Lord Poppet is an amazing personality, a humble human being who's ready to help anyone who is at his doorstep. So a loud welcome, a huge round of applause for Lord Dollar Poppet. Lord Poppet, we welcome you to this event of Lohana Youth League. Before we hand over the stage to you, Lord Poppet, what we're going to do is have a formal invitation presented to you by the president of the Lohana Youth League, Dr. Deep Bayani. A gentleman, Deep Bayani, is an amazing personality. May I introduce him, a professional gentleman, head of the physiotherapy and a wellness center at the MP Shah Hospital. He's a doctor of medicine, also in acupuncture, an executive MBA in the healthcare leadership, a bachelor's of physiotherapy, studied football medicine with the FIFA and a life member of the Red Cross Society. And once again, a hardworking individual for the Lohana community at the Lohana Youth League in Nairobi. Dr. Deep Bayani, can we have some words from you? Binaben, if you can unmute Dr. Deep Bayani, please. Trishula, are you here if uh, Deep's not here or? Yep, hello. Ah, there you go, Dr. Deep Bayani, welcome on board. Good evening, thank you very much for such a warm welcome. Uh, I would like to start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to you all. I just wanted to start off by welcoming Lord Dola Poppert on this session as we eagerly await to hear about his journey. Before handing it over to Lord Poppert, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a few points of the Lahana Youth League and its initiatives. The Lahana Youth League is one of the five member institutions falling under the Lahana community in Nairobi. It comprises a dedicated team and a large member base of 75 members of which 17 members constitute to being the core team committee. In terms of initiatives we run, in addition to support projects such as a Lohana hotline, as we know we are facing through uh, tough times and the pandemic situation, we uh, as Lohana Youth League have uh, initiated the Lohana hotline, which was created for community members to reach out to them for help or any volunteering assistance, keeping in light the COVID-19. <coughs> we are also a business-related initiative, a privileged program in collaboration with Lohana Majan Mandal that connects businesses that have partnered with us to Lohana members, providing them with discounts on products and services offered by them. Most of the vendor institutions that have partnered with us are Lohana businesses and the aim of the previous part program is to benefit Lohana members and businesses. Basically, it's uh, keeping as uh, by Lohana for Lohanas and improving Lohana for the betterment of Lohana. Lord Dola Popat has of <coughs> course had great interest in business from a very early age and has achieved a vast amount of success in his entrepreneurial activities. And we therefore look forward to tips from him in this nice. regard, which we are which we are sure will all benefit from it. Without further ado, I would like to hand this back to Ladibai so we can formally begin this. <coughs> very much, and a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Popat. Thank you very much, Dr. Deep Bayani, for that wonderful welcome for uh, Lord Dr. Popat and uh, information about the Lohana Youth League in Nairobi. Uh, also, may I request all the Zoom guests, if you can remain mute, because there seems to be some uh, disturbance coming in, so the transmission is being disturbed a little bit. So humble request to all of you, if you remain on the mute, thank you. And Mina I think there is also a function where we can mute everybody except the speaker. So thank you very much. And moving on, uh, so what we're going to do at this stage is we have this lovely philanthropic lady all the way from Nakuru, Age has not been anything, any issue for her. At 75, she's Zooming these sessions for the benefit globally of all the human beings and none other than our Meena Ben Kagram, who is going to now kindly welcome Lord Poppert 
and we'll then continue with our session. Mina Bell, if I may request you to turn on your uh, video. I am there. <laughs> Hello, Jesse Krishna to everybody. Jesse Krishna. Uh, Krishna. Um, I will officially welcome you with a special Tilak and thank you, Akshat. And I'll take Aarti for you. And since it is today is a um, special day, Ajay Agyaras Che Ane Tame Param Param Vaishnav Nadikra Cho To Malaji for you. Here are Ramesh. Thank you, Ramesh Bhai. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I will introduce Ramesh, my husband. You, you'll soon know where is he from. And Ellie, my co-host. Wow. Hi, Dr. Hey. Dola. Hi, Hi. Lani. <laughs> okay. So I'll ask Ramesh Kagram to go so I can have my space. Before, before I go, I just want to say one thing. He, besides his name, he manages finance like his name. And I, do, I think in the finances, he manages dollar, sterling, pound, everything. Thank you and welcome to the Zoom. Thank you, Lordship. Yeah. As you can see, uh, your books are displayed, but you can also see the three flags are here. Global Namaskar to all. Jambo, Karibu, Jai Hind. <coughs> Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Nakuru, town of world famous flamingos and where fastest runner in the world are born. I'm so excited and proud to welcome Lord Dollar Popat. Dollar Bai, you are now Mazungu, Kabisa. <laughs> and serving your karma bhumi united kingdom your roots are from india and you are celebrating all hindu festivals and today is independence day jai hind <coughs> but dollar bai your janma bhumi is east africa and i have one secret to share you love mogo matoki and Makai. Correct. <clears throat> Your text messages are very short and secret you. <clears throat> I'm not surprised as all keen golfers talk to their own golf balls. So they have no time for us. Sure. You play table football with your nephews and sons and giving town a, and you gave a tours to house of lords this is a new information from your webai wow welcome again dollar thank you. <clears throat> thank you for coming you can see all three plates <clears throat> are dis displayed now it is my humble duty to introduce my kid cousin, Dr. Lalit Soda from Hulaya, London, England. Both are suited, I can see. He's a doctor of chiropractic, a public speaker in his profession, and conducts many events as an MC at corporate levels. <coughs> he has authored a book about the basic of Pushti Marag, which is this one. And he lectures. He lectures freely, everywhere, freely, word of faith. Currently, he is a busy guest speaker introducing, 
internationally on Zoom. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. Lalit Bhai is a very kind soul. Since lockdown, he has been visiting older people and fixing their bonds, counseling, and arranging satsangs and take part in people's life who have lost their loved ones. He conducted many series of Facebook like basic <clears throat> yoga to stretch body, questions and answer sessions and special sessions he did was for people working from home. How to save their back and neck all free of charge, dollar by Muffat, NHF. For last four months, every week, he MC Zoom session with me for about eight weeks, yeah? He too is an East African total. <clears throat> He's a star, five-star man with multi-talent. Over to you, Lalit Bhai. Thank you very much, Meena Ben. Today we have a session uh, Lord Popper, so we're going to be concentrating on the uh, Lord Popper, welcome this afternoon in the United Kingdom to this Zoom session. I would open up this session with, uh, with all the greetings to you, and um, you can, uh, we can start off with your few words, and then we can take on to the questions and answers. Sure. Thank you, thank you Lalit for that very warm welcome and a very generous introduction you gave. And Minaben, thank you as well for that very good introduction you gave and very warm welcome you gave me here. It is my pleasure to interact and participate in this webinar hosted by the by Dip uh, Bayani and Minaben Kagaram and of course the Lohana um, Youth League of Nairobi. Um, so thank you for you know welcoming me into this webinar. My namaskar and pranam to all the Zoom listeners of this program today. Um, what what an initiative by Minaben to do something like this to exchange ideas and information and to listen to people um, in this post COVID nineteen. The world will not and should not be the same again. Uh, life costs little lifestyles that would what we spend money on so post covid 19 all of this will change we have to learn to live with this new reality and hence we have got this zoom program for people all over the world to listen to and 2020 is certainly a year that will be forgot that will never be forgotten it's something we remember for many years to come it's a different world we are living in now and for most if not all of us it has brought about many unexpected um, changes, uh, changes to our daily routine, to our lifestyle, to our work, and even our relationship with family and friends. So COVID-19 has changed so much. It may be for the better, who knows? Only time will tell us. But challenges we are going to face today and in future with individuals, communities, and countries right now are tremendous. And UK and Kenya are no exception in this COVID-19. Um, so that's what I would say, and I'm glad I'm here today taking part in this very important debate and discussion. Of course, I'll welcome questions later on from your Zoom listeners too. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lord Poppet. Uh, we're gonna, as, as we understand, we're gonna make this a very interactive <coughs> session today for sure. all the benefit of the, all the viewers and the audience we have with us. So one of the questions that had come through was, uh, let me ask you by saying about the United Kingdom economy that we are going through right now. It was announced yesterday that the United <clears throat> Kingdom is, uh, well, a couple of days ago, I believe, is, uh, is officially in recession. Uh, what, what, what impact has COVID-19 had on our economy, but also the global economy? If you can shed some light on that. Sure. In fact, um, yes, it was officially announced that we're in recession. By definition, if we have uh, a drop of our GDP for two consecutive quarters, then we are in recession. But Lalit, this is not recession. It is something far worse. You know, it will have lasting economic damage um, 
uh, to the whole world, still there to come. The real roller coaster is yet to, to, to come. You know, the dust will hit the fan um, as time goes by. And uh, the big changes in, medic in medical terms, Rishi Sonak has given our economy what I would say paracetamol, you know, to, to help us with the pain we are going through uh, in the short term. In the long run, he will need to give, um, you know, we'll need a ventilator to re reorganize and reboost our economy. You know, Rishi has made a good start with many announcements, including, you know, reduction of VAT for hospitality. You know, you can eat at half the price um, in restaurants and easy access to finance, bank guarantees for small and medium sized businesses. He's introduced a loan scheme to 11 million workers, 80% wages paid by the government, not exceeding 25,000. So I would say that paracetamol ventilators all come in now, but we need what, we, what I would say, our economy needs electrolytes, you know, in medical terms, you know, and we need to reorganize ourselves to see how well we can recover from this nasty pandemic 19, you know, and a severe depression that we're going to go through in the next 18 months, two years, you know. This week we talked about the planning reform that's going to take place, which will help a lot. But there are many other areas that he needs to focus on. We need to work on our export-oriented companies who export. We need to help them, to support them. We need more exports because we don't have enough exports to pay for imports, for example. We need to improve our access to finance for SMEs. We need to obviously build our HS2 and HS3, something when I was a transport minister, we talked about it for a long time, nothing has happened yet. So we need to take action or run with three, maybe at Heathrow Airport and many other infrastructure investment, you know, roads and buildings and houses and all that. They don't pay in the short term, but they do pay in the long term, but they create jobs and they create wealth and they help our economy. So Rishi is doing the best he can. He's an amazing chancellor, I must say. Yes, you mentioned him a couple of times and he's been an amazing person who has helped <laughs> the population at large in the United Kingdom. Uh, so moving on to his topic, it's interesting. He's our chancellor who is also of a Kenyan origin. How would you sum him up? He's, he's, he's doing some amazing stuff uh, for, for, the, for the population. Uh, but from your opinion, uh, let's have your opinion about him. Sure. I would say Ugandan Indians and Kenyan Indians are doing pretty wealthy, as you know, yeah. not just in the field of politics, in the field of economy, in the field of education. If you look at the thousand richest people, you will see about 30 to 40 of those Ugandan Kenyan Asians in that list. So, but Rishi is refreshingly new. You know, he, he, his face is not connected with economic downturn or Brexit or any controversy within the political system. So Rishi is known for maintaining friendly relations with all parliamentarians. He's friendly and effective by keeping the lines of communication open to all of us. In fact, the, his 3,000 old staff at Treasury uh, report that he's intellectual joy and pleasure to work with. Uh, he's you know, a chancellor of fluency on his feet. He speaks his mind up, uh, uh, an easy, empathetic style um, a lot to do with his popularity as well. It is worth pausing, Lalit, to admire the man in which someone who is just a year ago serving as um, a junior minister, and today is likely to be uh, the next prime minister, somebody who came in parliament in 2015. I will, I will give credit to our ex-prime minister, David Cameron, who obviously gave him a safe seat of Richmond, which was occupied by our foreign secretary then, William Hague. So a new member of parliament of Kenyan origin, of Indian origin, a Hindu, and now number two in our cabinet. So Rishi's, you know, his ranking is, the best ranking, political ranking that we've had in the last 50 years was Tony Blair, which was 62% in 1997. As we speak, Rishi is also 62%. Who knows, maybe the next British Indian prime minister. Hey, that sounds very promising on an Independence Day today. And uh, absolutely, he's a gentleman with amazing skills, amazing intelligence, and a huge <clears throat> burden on his shoulders he's carrying right now for the population <clears throat> of the United Kingdom, and also uh, a big economy in the whole world. So bless him, he's, he's doing his best, and we need to support him to the fullest that we can. 
So yeah, I think everybody holds a very high ranking for our right. Rishi Sunak. Yeah. <coughs> Having said that, uh, Lord Robert, you mentioned how the the Gujarati community from Kenya and Uganda have excelled in Britain. Today we have some amazing dignitaries who have joined us. Uh, there is the president for the Lohana community, United Kingdom. There is uh, Sunil Bhai Majitya. There is the secretary for Lohana community, United Kingdom, Bharat Soda. There is an ex-president of the Lohani community, Nairobi, Mr. Mehu Bhai Savani. And also, I believe, Yatin Bhai Dabda from the Lohana community, North London, is going to be joining. And all the way from India, we have Mr. Satish Bhai Vitalani, who is representing the Lohana Mahaparishad. So all these Lohanas, Gujaratis, Indians have made <laughs> their way, their mark in any country they've gone to. Amazing. In fact, David Cameron said in his speech uh, when I launched the Conservative Friends of India with him, that the best immigrants this country has ever had are the East African Indians. Absolutely. And now we've got, we've got four cabinet ministers of Indian origin, we've got six ministers of state of Indian origin. So it shows that how well they've excelled. But the, the best place they've excelled is in the city of London. If you look at um, the chairperson Prudential, Shriti Vadera, um, uh, the group finance director of um, uh, Barclays Bank is Chapkul Majitia from Saroti, from Uganda as well. So large number of Ugandan Indians, uh, Kenyan Indians have excelled both in the city of London, but in, in, in enterprise as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And just logged in is our lovely lady from the Asian Foundation, who is Meera Pandit from the Kenyan Asian Foundation. So Indians are, are really celebrating their mark and, and doing extremely <clears throat> well. So that's very nice, hard working. Now, moving on to another question that was something that was quite near and dear to what your work that you do as a trade envoy. So let me ask you about your role as the prime minister's trade envoy to Rwanda and Uganda. You had this job <laughs> for about three years now. What yeah. difference have you personally made? <laughs> and the second part to this question would be what economic impact will COVID-19 have on these East African countries? Okay, let me ask, answer the first part. In fact, sure. the, the difference we made, I mean, the trade annual program came for, uh, was launched by David Cameron. When I stood down as a minister, he said, since you're low for, originally he says, would you want to do something with India or send it to Delhi? I said, no. Um, and he said, you got low for Uganda, so why don't I make you trade envoy for Uganda and neighboring country Rwanda? I'd been to Rwanda with him once before, so I was quite familiar with Rwanda. Now, what difference have I made? In fact, uh, huge. In fact, our, our trade with Rwanda has more or less doubled, uh, threefold more or less. You know, we now have direct flight to London, Kigali, London. So the Rwandan government bought two airbuses from UK, and those airbuses, 30% of the content of the airbus is the, the engines that go in our A330s. <clears throat> and of course, um, we have fantastic brand in our fo football league. Um, so I managed to negotiate with the Rwandan government to send Arsenal Football Club to, you know, so that was a 30 million pound deal over three years, which is good export for the UK. I took an agri-tech um, delegation to Kigali, and now we are buying fruit and veg coming directly from Kigali to London because of Airbus's where 330s have 30 tons of cargo. So a uh, huge difference to the two countries. But it's building bridges. It's important post-Brexit and COVID-19 now as well. So we are building those bridges, which is very successful. Let me go back to Uganda. In fact, the, we, we managed to get um, um, an in, to build an international airport by a British company called Collas. So we're building an international airport worth about 330 million euros. Uh, that's by a British company. Um, we recently sold two Airbuses, um, three Airbuses, yep, and, um, and we'll soon be flying from March next year, London and Tebe, London. Uh, again, those Airbuses of engine and ships and other content, which is UK made. Um, and Uganda has huge oil, you know, reserve. And UK companies involved in that. There's some $11 billion worth of uh, projects going to go through, which is to build the, the pi pipeline and refinery. Some three billion pound worth of UK companies involvement is there when it happens. So we're building a new industrial park. So you know we are <clears throat> working with Ugandan government uh, to to help Uganda to help Rwanda. It's one way, Lalit, 
you know, if you want to get people out of poverty, it's not through aid, but through trade. It's a trade that will help to, uh, to enhance their well-being, raise the living standard, and get more people out of poverty and create jobs involved. One of the main things that was a game changer was we have a UK export finance arm and Uganda had a limit of 60 million that we raised to 600 million. So all these things have helped um, Uganda and Rwanda in many ways. Now, the second part of your question, what economic impact will uh, East Africa have? In fact, economic impact the whole world will have. It's going to be universal. But for example, Kenya and Ramesh Pai Kagram will agree with me. The biggest, the seven, the seven million people who worked in tourism in Kenya, this all stopped. You know, tourism brings about 1.5, 1.25 billion dollars to Kenya. The two million tourists coming to Kenya every year. Same thing with Rwanda and Uganda. So it, they'll be hit by income from tourism. They'll be hit by remittances coming from UK and US to um, Uganda, Kenya, and Rwanda. But most important, Kenya exports flowers and fruits and veg and all that. That is more or less not happening. So all this, the export, the tourism, the remittance coming in, so it's going to be hit them very, very hard, uh, the Kenyan economy. It's only time will obviously heal this, but it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a long haul. Great. Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, just, uh, <coughs> things that you mentioned about this in your book, and you said in the last page, in the last paragraph of your book and the last sentence, you said, people continue to still make the mistake of understanding Africa. It can have a bright future, but we need to develop the next generation of business people and politicians <laughs> and ensure that the best principles of trade and democracy are embedded across the continent. This is a worthy aim and one to which I would happily devote the rest of my life. Why does Africa mean so much to you? Well, Alec, me and you are children of Africa. We are child Absolutely. of Africa. We love East Africa. I mean, I've been quite right to say that I love my Mogo Matoki, um, and I don't miss it. And one of the things I did as a trade envoy was now we are getting Ugandan Mogo and Matoki. And if you go to Tesco Sainsbury's, you will see Rwandan tea. So I'm a child of Africa, and Africa is an amazing continent, 1.3 billion people. I was born there. Um, you know, I, I see in UK, Lalit, I visit many, many businesses and the English businesses, the large and small ones, sees Africa with a band-aid lens. This continent is poor, is coming to bag money. Uh, this continent has, you know, has got tribal problems, is corrupt and all that. But we must remember that this is a young democracy, you know, 70, 60, 70 years young, um, you know, and we are 800 years young, and you can see the constitutional crisis we are going through. Yes. So you must give a chance to Africa. It will take time, but Africa with 1.3 billion people, amazing natural resources, very fertile land, you know, fantastic, you know, things like gold, diamond, oil, you name it, Africa has got it. The 400 million middle class people, the very highly educated Africans as well now. I think if we give them a chance, if we give them the opportunity, that continent will thrive another 10, 15, 20 years from now. And we have a mutual benefit working with them because most of those countries were ex-colonies. So I have that love for Africa. I have love for African food. Um, <clears throat> I'm married to an African girl, although Indian origin. So she was born as well in Africa, in Mombasa, uh, not far from Nairobi. So uh, Africa, for you even, Dalit, your father was a great admirer of uh, Kenya all the time. He, he talked about it. He enjoyed his work at Barclays in Barclays, DCO, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> District Colonial Office. That's correct. Yes, those were the days. It was called Barclays DCO. Yeah. That's very true. <clears throat> now, that's amazing. Your love, your passion <clears throat> for Africa just shows for what you do for them. Now, both Uganda and Rwanda are countries that are part of the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Robert. You supported Rwanda's bid to host the CHOGM. Tell us about your passion for the Commonwealth. <clears throat> Again, Lalit, we are children of Commonwealth, all of us, 54 countries. Um, I always say that uh, Europe, our neighbors or trading partners, America is our ally, but Commonwealth is our family. So Commonwealth is our family. The commonality we have with Commonwealth, English language, rule of law, judiciary, democracy, the education, the health system, very similar. Um, 
And I see people who come to UK as immigrants like myself, and many others, people of African origin from Uganda, Kenya, they come here because they speak English and the values are very similar. They integrate very quickly. And look at the number of Commonwealth doctors who work in INHS. That's absolutely correct. So many from the East African countries have come to work with the National Health Service and other <clears throat> industry yeah. in, in the Britain. So yeah, amazing. So love for Commonwealth is definitely there. Moving on, uh, Lord Poppet, there's some questions that we have about your <coughs> lovely book that you actually authored, A British Subject. Now, I'd like to say the global audience that's viewing this uh, seminar today on Zoom, on Facebook. This is one book that one should definitely have and read. And this tells us <coughs> a, lot of, a, a lot about yourself, your struggles, and how you made it from a waiter at Wimpy <coughs> to the Houses of Lords. So I have a few questions regarding a British subject. Is that okay with you? Sure. So my first question would be, what actually inspired you to write this book? Well, good question. Well, I, I actually didn't want to write the book. You know, it feels a bit self-obsessed when you write your own book. You're, you know, being egoistic. You want to show off what you are and who you are. And it's not me. I'm afraid I didn't want to. But Lalit, I, when some of the parliamentarians heard my story, including the ex-Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, and many others, in fact, inspired me to write. But one particular person was Michael Dobbs. Michael is Lord Dobbs and I used to share office. And when one of my chief of staff, my, uh, Mark Fletcher, mentioned about my background, where I came from and all that, that I used to, came as a, more or less, as on a student visa, but refugee status, got as a waiter and I learned English in a wimpy bar and all that. And, and uh, you know, Michael said, Dolly, you must write a book, you know, about yourself because um, the, the story is so relevant today in the United Kingdom with uh, a large number of immigrants who are coming to this country and settle. So it's mainly the book is more or less addressed to new immigrants coming to this country. Um, that if you come here, if you work hard, if you engage, if you integrate, if you speak English uh, and embrace the value of this great country, you can make it as well. And you look at the children of immigrants today in the United Kingdom are excelling in education. Absolutely, absolutely, very true. So great inspiration. And I don't think it's being egoistic. I think from printing your book, uh, reading your autobiography is an inspiration to other people who can read your life story and aim to become somebody like yourself. So Correct. I mean, I, you, you know, I, I hate to see that people coming to this country abuse our system. People see too many communities coming uh, in the, to the UK and don't integrate and don't work hard to, to learn the language and, and get a job and become so reliant on, on our welfare system. And, and this book says that, listen, you know, if you come and if you work hard, you can make it. You don't have to be reliant and you can make a success. Now, you talked earlier about the success of East African Indians, and what I'm saying, my story is no different really from yours, and many East African Indians are listening to this program. You know, that book, is, there's no commonality of my story with your story, and their story too. You know, we came, worked hard, <clears throat> we gave more than we took from the Treasury, um, and now Rishi is there, our uh, Hindu Chancellor, he probably can give us more, but we want to give more to Rishi. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. Now, uh, a little bit of a question that's going to add a little twist over here. What is it that makes you a patriotic Brit? Are you not proud of your Indian heritage, Lord Popper? Of course, Lalitha, I'm proud to be Ugandan born with Indian heritage and proud to be British subject, proud to be Hindu, proud to be Gujarati, and, and, and very proud to be Lohana as well. And this diverse uh, identity is something we all celebrate here in UK. So it's a good, it's a fantastic identity, you know. Um, but I think it's important that people understand that when you live in Britain, you have responsibilities uh, to integrate and to get involved, uh, to learn the language, uh, to work hard, to respect and learn about the country's heritage. These are all the, you know, all requirements for you to, Make yourself feel at home and make a success of yourself. 
but most important, you can pass the success to your children. And look at what this country gives, uh, Lalit, to all of us. Amazing education for children, all the opportunities you can think of. There's not one thing, from the time Lalit, a child is born in this country, in the United Kingdom, you get a um, thousand pounds to the mother who just had a child. Then the child gets child benefit to the age of 18, education thereafter. In your old age, you get free national health service, free care home. Uh, on your that, in fact, uh, you know, if you don't have money, they provide for the coffin. In a nice way, if I put it in Gujarati, Lalit, any biological mother, Devkima, and Yasoda adopted him. And look at the low Krishna Bhagwan head for Yashodama. You can see my love for the United Kingdom. And this is true with you and with many Indians who live in this country. They have a tremendous love for our country. Absolutely true, Lord Poppert. A proud Indian, yet a, even a more proud British. Okay. So you, can see, you, can see my union, you can see my Union Jack, and Mina Ben has got the Kenyan flag, the Indian flag, and the Union Jack. Now, Ramesh Pai and Mina Ben are celebrating this diversity of origins of three different countries. Absolutely correct. And uh, she's a passionate British too when she's here. But uh, very well put, Lord Poppert. The way you explained uh, the biological mother of Krishna and the mother who raised him gave so much right. love. So, of course, British uh, Britain <clears throat> has actually brought us up here and provided for us. So really, absolutely, very much of um, a lover of Britain too. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely answer. Now, moving on to the next one about your book, the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, gave a very moving and a heartfelt forward to your book. He said, you are one of those modest, most modest people he has ever met and saw you as a man guided by family, faith, political conviction, and deep love for his country. What guided you in this way? Well, I explained earlier the, the deep love for this country. Uh, and obviously that was very nice of David Cameron to put very generous forward. In fact, I didn't expect to be as generous as that, but I worked very closely with him and I worked for the previous three prime ministers as you quite rightly said in your introduction. Um, but you know, it's, it's, we Hindus believe in hard work, education, enterprise, family, faith. These are our values. These are the conservative values. There's no way we can be labor or liberal supporter. But people who inspired me to go into politics was people like Shantarupra, Sergei Gohil, but most important, late Manubai Madhwani as well. When I was a young kid, he says, you know, we were kicked down from Uganda. I think we should get more involved in politics in this country. And um, Margaret Thatcher set up English and Concerted in Finchley, uh, where Jay Gohil became the chairman and I became the secretary. So it's the inspiration of many of, of our, my elders, my good friends, Abla Wadilo. I mean, one other person who inspired me and I, I, he, you know, I worked as a secretary for him was your own father, Lalit Amrutpai. When Raghu was the charitable trust, he became the chairman and he invited me to become the secretary. During his uh, time that we managed to get the planning permission to build a new center. So, you know, <clears throat> it's learning about leadership. Leadership is key. And one of the problems we have in this country, we are short of good leaders. So this is how I learned from my own, you know, friends and families and, and people like, as I say, late Manubai, your father, Gohil, Santorupro. Thank you for that. And I believe uh, our lovely friend, late Manubai Madhwani's widow, Mrs. Shahada bin Madhwani has also joined in, in today's Zoom session. <coughs> thrilled to hear about Manubai. So Shahada bin, Namaskar Shahada bin. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Poppet, for that amazing answer. Uh, you also worked very much in conjunction with my late father, and he always used to have nothing but praise about you. And he Thank always you. said, that young man, Dollar, is going to get, is going to go to the heights of Britain. And here <laughs> you are. Uh, and, and really, we remember him in such a nice way. 
and, and you praising my dad. So thank you very much for that. He had equal and more praises for you. Lalit ba i mara guru mara mabap abada wadilo ni kupashe mani. That's why. Otherwise, I am just a simple man. I wouldn't have made it. It's a blessing to me, I must say. And I'm really privileged to be obviously talking to you. And I'm privileged that so many people listening to today's program. And I'm privileged to serve this great country as a member of parliament. A very humble human being. Moving on, in, in your, in your, you said uh, your <laughs> views about immigration in your book are quite, uh, quite strong, as you say. You put it there saying that immigrants must immigrate and speak English. They should be able to communicate. What do you say to people who say that when they come as um, who say you came as an immigrant too into the United Kingdom? What makes a good immigrant? Well, I explained earlier what makes a good immigrant: hard work, education, enterprise, and all that, and all those values, embracing British values, but accepting British values, adopting this country as their own country, and uh, and and speak English. You know, these are key. So. We, what I'm saying about immigration here is also that we, it's, it's, it's not the quantity, it's the quality of immigrants we have. That's important. I mean, the 18% of National Health Service doctors, well, it's since you're in the medical field, are from Indian origin, or from East Africa or India. And the reason they are successful as doctors is because they can communicate. They come from those colonies, you know, that part of the Commonwealth. So uh, communication is very, very vital, you know, one must learn the language. It is not only, you know, and fully understand other people as well. But, um, so we should be selective in who we take. And that's rightly so. If we're going to get an immigrant into this country, we also want that immigrant to be contributing to the country. Correct, and yeah. You know, you, you, as I said earlier, we view more for the Persian than our sport. And yeah. that's key. And, and we see immigrants coming from many parts of the world, like Syria, Iraq, and others, who are really living on welfare unnecessarily you know we they should work hard to find a job and learn english and integrate and make a success not for their good but for the good of the children it's for their absolutely. own benefit absolutely correct undertake those civic duties and uphold the democracy which is very key for for our country yes yes now lord puppet moving on to a different subject totally you recently <laughs> were involved in a report which you were commissioned to write by the Lohana community <coughs> titled An Aging Population. After you spoke about the implications of aging at last year's Lohana Global Convention. And this is the report you came with. An amazing report that has been compiled by yourself and your team. So moving on that questions, is that okay if we take questions on this now, Lord Popper? Sure, yeah, certainly, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. You and your team, consisting of Rupa Ganatra Popat and Rupal Kantaria and Amit Jogya, spent 2,000 hours doing sure. research on this project. What was your drive to invest so much in this topic? I think, firstly, I would like to thank and acknowledge the Hana community, North London, Yatin Bain Chandra Barugani. Uh, it was in many ways their idea initiative. Uh, they were concerned about the aging population, so was I. In fact, uh, in many ways it came to the, you know, it came, it boiled up in the head because I gave a speech in Dubai last year on the convention <coughs> that this is a, a big a problem we are going to face as time goes by. Uh, and we have to find, you know, uh, this is a challenge. We're gonna find solutions to this great challenge to our community. So Yatin Bai and Chandu Bai and, and of course Ashok Bai Kotecha from Leicester and um, Sunil Bai and Majitya and all others helped me together. I couldn't have done this report together, but my, my team members were Rupa Kuntaria, <coughs> Rupa <coughs> Poppet, and my long-standing parliamentary assistant, who you know, Lalit, Amit uh, Jogia, they all worked with me. Yeah, we took interviews from um, 120 people in the institution, as you earlier said in your introduction, uh, we met with the Jewish uh, uh, Jewish care and also the Smiley community, how they address this major problem that we are now facing and it's become more important post COVID-19. Um, spent 2000 hours, it took 18 months to do. We've sent out about 40,000 electronic copies 
And um, obviously, if anybody wants hard copies and all electronic copies, please email Mina Ben. We'll be happy to post them, the copies to Nairobi or Mombasa. I know we'd received, or Mr. Bayani, Deep Bayani can email me as well. Happy to send them, you know, electronically 40,000, yet in has managed to send out throughout the world. And this is not the problem of Luhana community in North London. It's universal. It applies to East African Indians. It applies to Americans. Uh, it applies to Canadians. Yeah. Canadians, Americans have been on the phone to me and email talking about it. They're also sent out to their members as well. And aging population, as you know, Lalith in UK is going up. Aging is inevitable. We age every second, every minute, every day, every week, every year. So, um, but the way we age is most important, you know. Um, and aging doesn't mean in the people who age, like when your father retired, you know, he may, it was a privilege for him uh, to make social and economic contribution. They can continue working and make that amazing contribution many do actually. And people are long, living longer than ever before, thanks to medical science and, and our own national health center. So, but as a community, we are not prepared how to address this issue. And um, you won't remember this Lalit, but East Africa, Minaben and Ramesh, they all will. That East Africa, one of the priority in the 60s was building Kanya Chatra. Manji Kaldas Mehta built Gurku for education for the girls. The key thing was education for the girls. Today in UK, in East Africa, in the US, in Canada, the key thing is how we address this Asian population. And collectively, we can all handle it well and give a better living to the aging population, give better care, you know, to this aging population. Um, all I can say that um, these extra years of life is a great gift. Um, we should all be able to enjoy it. And yet, when I did my research, I realized 90% don't. I went to see a couple of people who had just retired you know, 66, 67. So I said, I asked him, what does retirement mean to you? He says, oh, I don't have to work anymore. And that was answered. They don't know there's a great living after that age. There's great enjoyment. They work their life. Come on, let's get best out of the extra lives we've got. So true. So true. And I think that is the biggest challenge the, the generation today is facing about the aging population. And I have a couple more questions that are leading to that. Lord Poppet, you have, besides you, I believe, a young gentleman councillor, Amit Jogya, who actually Correct. assisted you in this project quite well and is, is absolutely <laughs> a great assistant to you. Uh, could we have on, him on the screen if you can say hello to the audience? Amit. I'll just call him. Amit, can you please come and join us? Lalisola wants to see you. A super gentleman. Amit has been a very hardworking young individual. And Amit is, if I may use this term and correct me if I'm wrong, Lord Poppet, an adopted son of yours. <laughs> correct. That's right. Yeah. An amazing. For many student. years. For me, for many years, yes. Yeah. So Amit is uh, one of those young counselors uh, who is working for a great cause, a good mission he has. So ladies and gentlemen, a global audience that we have, this is a young, a budding counselor that we want to make sure we support him to his mission. And he's supporting Lord Poppet in such a way that the mission becomes possible. So Amit, thank you very much. Thanks for this amazing <clears throat> project you. that you took on and uh, all the best wishes to you from myself personally, but also from the global audience that's listening to you today. Thank you for those kind words. And it's a pleasure to uh, listen to uh, this uh, forum uh, all the way live from uh, Kenya. So it's a pleasure. And thank you for all the great work that you do for the community, both here and across the world. That's thank great. you, Amit. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Lord Robert, uh, moving on to a question uh, was about this, uh, this um, report that you commissioned. How has the report currently been received by the community, particularly on such sensitive topics? Sorry, can you ask this question again, Lily? Sorry. Sure. Um, how has this report that, you, uh, that you, you compiled, how has this report been received by the community, particularly on some of the sensitive topics? As I said, the report has been posted or has gone electronically roughly 40,000. 
and a large number of other organizations, people like Oshwal and Patida Samaj and Know Nath and Prajapati, they've also taken a copy of this report um, to send to their members because the issues and the challenges we face, as I said, is universal and it is also applies to them. And, um, you know, there's many ways we can, you know, reduce the misery of suffering of old age by addressing some of the recommendations I've already put in. And Yatin Bai and uh, Sunil uh, Bajetia, they're going to have these meetings with the community, consult them, discuss them, um, and come up with how we address the solutions to these challenges. But the report has been well received, believe me, I've not received a single um, criticism, and Yatin Bai receives requests for report every five minutes of the day. So do we, by the way, we had one from uh, Nairobi today as well, didn't we? What was his name? Right. He came by. He, somebody sent a WhatsApp. He sent yes. this thing. He was ex chairman. Forgive my mobile, I'll tell you. That's correct. It's Mr. Mehul Bai Savani. Correct. Yeah. Yeah he. yeah. he requested, in fact, has mentioned on the chat box and also WhatsApp me. How can he get a hold of these reports? So, Actually, Mina Ben uh, from Nakuru had posted a copy to him. He was absolutely thoroughly impressed by the report that he read and he mentioned how he can get a hold of it. So I believe if Mehul Bai can connect with yourself, he's the ex-president of the Lohana community <clears throat> in Nairobi, uh, either with yourself or Deep Bayani or Mina Ben, I'm sure he'll get the electronic version from you, you sure. people, right? Well, if I just add something on that. Yes. In fact, all, all the challenges we have and we have the solutions for it, and they're not difficult to implement. It needs human resources and financial resources. Now, two of the greatest asset Luhana community have here in UK is just two, human resources and financial. We haven't got a third one, by the way. When I say human resources, we've got highly intelligent people, young generation wanting to do work, willing to do work, willing to provide and care for people and do that philanthropic work and give the service. In terms of financial resources, Lohanas are the richest community in this country. Come on. I, I now am addressing to other Lohanas listening to this. Let's look at this report. Let's discuss and debate with the community and let's come up with the solutions. They're not difficult. These challenges are very difficult, by the way. We need to address them. Surely, absolutely, and that's very correct. In fact, the president of the Lohana community in Nairobi has just logged in, Mr. Pravin Baikanani, who was also very much interested in this report <clears throat> and knowing what they can do, how they can help the aging population in Africa also. So I think, uh, Mr. Kanani, this is a great way to get your report from uh, Lord Poppert. Uh, so email either Deep Bayani or Lord Poppert himself We'll certainly make sure that these reports are available and made available to yourself. Moving on to another question about this uh, report that you published, Lord Poppert, and you mentioned that uh, uh, loneliness plays a very large part of your report. What lessons have you got for the community, particularly on this topic of loneliness? Lalit, you know loneliness is in fact loneliness brings an illness that brings dementia that brings depression uh, and feeling lonely almost double almost doubles the risk of an elderly person dying um, so it's important to note that loneliness is not always the same as being alone and whether you live in a 800 square feet flat or a 3000 square feet of house loneliness is the same and from my experience, from, from my observation, people just, you know, don't want to just chat, not about family, religion, or the community, but they just want to chat generally. So, you know, if we have a hotline for loneliness in UK, where we can ring the people who live alone or lonely, Ken Chomasi, Kemne, good morning, Jesse Krishna, you know, Asta, Joyu, Bapuni, Katareshe, Ate, you know, Sanna, good night, Kokfon Kare. It gives a sense of belonging. It gives something to look forward to. When I went to doing our research, and Lalit, you might wonder, how did you do this research in 18 months? Well, remember we had election last year in UK. And what I did, Lalit, that during election time, when I went to Coventry, Leicester, Birmingham, um, even Cambridge, uh, North London, Moor Park, Northwood, all those places, we knocked doors for people asking them to vote for my party, the Conservative Party. 
And when I saw Lohana's surname, I entered the house, had tea with them and started talking. So this is how I took a lot of evidence from people. Um, um, and I found many elderly people living on their own, very lonely, but, you know, um, and um, I felt sorry for them. And it's so true. I think this, this created a huge experience for yourself personally and for, for everybody to, for you to share that with everybody. I think that's amazing. And I think this report brings out a lot of issues that we can deal with. And one of them you actually mentioned that uh, we would love to hear from you actually is how can uh, you help the older people to adapt to technological changes <clears throat> and join the online platforms like this? I think life has changed so much in, because of technology and even made it more difficult because of COVID-19. This technology is crucial, is key uh, nowadays, and most older people cannot um, use technology. Lalit, we are talking in technology, Zoom today. Yes. You know, neither you nor, nor me knew how to connect this three years ago. And there you are, we can connect in a few seconds and talk in Nakuru and uh, Mombasa, Nairobi, to our dip and all that. Um, and to obviously our other leaders who are listening to this program or are a part of this program. So technology is key for elderly people. Even Lalit, if I want an appointment with your surgery, I can't speak to Lalit. I need a worst apps to, to get that appointment. Even doctor's appointment is now through technology. Even your prescriptions come through technology. So technology is key for elderly people to learn. And our new generation are so good. So I think the community should find a way of training our elderly in technology, having those regular once or twice a week classes. And Yathin Bai and Jandul Bai will confirm that so many young generation have come up now, volunteering that we will do all this for you. Many doctors will come forward as well. So I think we can cash um, on the outcome of this report and the generosity our members have shown in helping our elderly. So technology is key. Um, loneliness is also important, technology is key. The other area, Lalita, I covered in the report was financial planning. A lot of people, I went to, give you an example, I went to Leicester, uh, to a middle-class family, husband, wife, in the mid seventies. One son is a doctor in London, the other one works in Birmingham, they're living on their own, and, and they were well-to-do. Got their children married. Now, all they have, they have no saving. All they have is a house, which is paid off, worth 300,000, but the, all the income is, is state pension. So I think financial planning is equally important, um, you know, as you get older. Absolutely, that's so, so true. Mentioning technology, Dollar Bai, uh, one of the things that actually happened was we have a prime example sitting in front of us, 75 year old Mina Ben yeah. is moving all over the world, learning sure. technology from anyone and everybody who can help her. And she has that amazing initiative to do that. And she is actually reaching out for help, which is so good. Also myself, I can tell you prior to lockdown, Zoom, I had no idea what that was. But luckily I have Bharat and his son and daughter, Ankush and Ankita, who helped me get connected and taught Correct. me how to do it. So I think, yes, the younger generation needs to have this patience with older generation to train them, help them get communicating to the rest of the world. And I think that's such an important aspect. <coughs> so Robert, moving on to some other questions. Lovely report, lovely book. We have to move on to a few more questions before time runs out. But there are some burning questions that we would like addressed. And my apologies in advance in asking these questions, but we would love to hear answers to these, if that's sure. okay with you. Can I just go back on the report, basically? The report covers, you know, attitude to aging. Um, it covers the pressure on medical care and our national health service. There's so much they can do, so a lot we've got to do ourselves. It covers the importance of family care and support. A large number of elderly people are helping their children for school runs and all that. So it's, they are making amazing economic and social contributions. So please have the correct attitude to aging. The housing shortages for elderly people. Some of them need special type of houses. And we can, you know, that large num the number of Lohana contractor company, building construction company in UK. Come on, we can build houses for them and sell them and make a profit. What's wrong with it? So I think there's a lot community can do. I hope Sunil Bai and Yatin Bai, they're all listening to all this. 
and our Bharat by Soda as well, to, you know, to make sure that when we get together, let's implement, let's execute the outing, the outcome of this report, having discussed and debated the community. Um, there's also gender and aging in our community. You know, there's, there's a problem there. You know, for example, I, I wouldn't know how to do my housework and my wife wouldn't know how to go and cash money from an ATM machine, you know? So we have that problem ourselves. We got to overcome those um, the gaps we have. Um, but also, I think one of the things I mentioned was the um, strengthening intergenerational links. We must, must as a community, we must intergenerational links, to the link between the father, the son, and the grandson. And that connection is vital between three generations of that family. All this is something new to learn, something new to do. Many are probably doing already. Many are learning to do. So I hope that when the community gathers, they can work to address this. It is it's not something we can saw it all night, but over a period of time we can. And I've been saying for many years, because many Lohanas are listening, that we need to reform our community. You know, a new constitution maybe, reform it completely, probably have an, a chief executive run our community, why not? Um, and these reforms are long overdue. Amazing summary of that. And all those points are so very valid. And I think if families are helpful to their elderly gener uh, uh, generations, I think that would make a huge difference. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lord Robert. Uh, if I may move on to some of uh, the controversial questions that I would like to pose in front of you. And I hope, uh, my apologies in advance, however, I hope you don't mind <laughs> me bringing them up. Um, I'm sorry, first of all, to being so controversial, but you were recently criticized by the mainstream press, particularly the Times, that you voted to remain in the EU. And you said in the House of Commons, where, um, in the House, when you were a minister, that leaving the EU was not an option. <laughs> you later became a moderate Brexiteer. In your trade on envoy role, you are now deemed to be a staunch Brexiteer. How can you justify this drastic change in your mindset? Yes, Lalit, in fact, uh, what you said is right. I, I, there was a question asked, me, asked to me as a minister, and I said, um, living in the European Union is not an option. But remember, I was 18 years old when we joined the European Union in 1972 under the premiership of Edward Heath. And we joined not the European Union, we joined the common market in a way we wanted to trade with each other. So trade is crucial, you know, somebody who comes from a business background, but our security is crucial. So I was a pro-European. Uh, Harold Wilson had a referendum where 73% people wanted to remain in, in common market. But common market change become European Union, Union. And therefore I became a moderate Brexiteer. The other thing I say that because I took government line. As a government minister in politics, you take government line. It, you know, politics is, should be about principle, there's no doubt about that. And David Cameron and George Osborne, and many others cabinet ministers were pro-Europeans and we, can, we campaigned to remain in the European Union. Uh, you know, having negotiated the best possible deal but then I became a moderate Brexiteer because when I was a minister, we, I was getting papers to sign quite often, legislation to sign, coming to Europe, to UK, um, something that was never discussed or debated in our parliament. So, you know, sometimes question, you know, is this the right way to run a country? We are Democrats, we have been the oldest democracy in the world, more, more than 800 years old. And here it is Brussels imposing legislation after legislation uh, you know, that was not discussed or debated in our parliament. So it wasn't good for democracy. So there was a, a balance of, so hold on, this is not right. And hold on, we want to be part of the European Union. So, you know, if we, if we left, for example, I wouldn't regret it. But then I became a Brexiteer, you're right, because I traveled Africa extensively. I saw the potential trade in Africa, and I mentioned the figures, the Uganda, Rwanda, and many others, um, that, you know, we have, huge market outside the European Union. The European Union is about 500 million. Africa is 1.3 billion. India is 1.3 billion. 
and we were so obsessed with Europe, you know, we became, you know, um, we became, we were not outward looking as such, you know, um, and we lost our freedom in many ways because Brussels became the ultimate lawmaker. Um, and there are many damaging legislation that I saw coming through the working time directives, for example, the chemicals directive, the the height at work directive and all those stupid things, you know, you know, farming and many others that I saw that this is really not on. So I'm now a staunch Brexit here because I believe we can do more trade with our family of Commonwealth, 54 countries. We can trade with India and Africa. And I think we, we became too continental. I use the word too continental. We saw nothing outside the European Union. Let's look beyond the European Union. And I see a huge potential there. And I think that is going to be the biggest advantage of exiting Europe, looking at it as a continental trade affair rather than just being stuck with the European <coughs> Union. So we hope for the best, but thank you for answering that question. If I just uh, say one more thing on legislation, yes. you know, in this country, for example, under common law, under English law, everything is legal, except that which is declared to be illegal. So everything you can do. And then they pass legislation, sorry, you can't do that, you can't do that. You can have a gathering of no more than 30 people. You must wear a mask when you go to the shop. So everything is okay, but until the law comes. Whereas <clears throat> in Europe, it was very much under Roman law, where everything is illegal except that which, which is specifically allowed. So there is the two different ideology of law. And what are we as parliamentarians? We are legislators. Absolutely true. I, if I may, move on to a next sure. question, uh, which <coughs> is also slightly controversial here. You have been working with the Conservative Party for over 40 years, Lord Poppet, serving five consecutive prime ministers. The press have criticized you for being a donor to the Conservative Party. What are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts, I'm very proud to have donated money. I've been a donor for 40 years, you know. Um, Conservative Party is a voluntary organization. Uh, if we love and value our uh, freedom and democracy, somebody has to finance political parties. Labor is financed by trade unionists. So businesses and individuals through membership finance the Conservative Party. But I've said in my book as well that, you know, we need to reform that too. It shouldn't be financed by individuals and organization or companies, I think let the taxpayer put the bill if they want to have the freedom and democracy that we enjoy here. But very, very proud to have given, but I think you should also look in the context of my other givings to voluntary organization charities. And this is a very small sum of money to what I give to other causes. And I'm, thank goodness I'm able to give. And I was very proud to give to the party that I allowed, worked with, enjoyed working with. Um, a party that uh, shares my ideology uh, and my community's ideology. All I wanted to see that party doing for us is, is getting more people of Indian origin or British Indian origin to become members of parliament, councils and so forth. And that's all happening. We can see it firsthand. We've got four cabinet ministers of Indian origin now. It, uh, Lord Poppert, it clearly shows in, in the current situation that that's absolutely helping. And you know what? People are going to criticize when you do something good. People are going to say good. People are not going to say the other way. So really, people don't really know. The media doesn't know how much silent donations you're making to charitable organizations. But this is something that's so visible, and they're probably going to blow it up. But yeah, thank you for answering that question also. Next question, moving on. As a member of the House of Lords, do you think that the House of Lords no longer serves its purpose and should be abolished? I wasn't expecting that question, Lalita. I don't Sorry. want to lose my job. So I'm going to give Absolutely a good answer not. to you. In fact, the House of Lords has been there for, as I said, nearly 800 years. Uh, it's a revising chamber. It holds government to account. Uh, we have people who are specialists in their field, for example. We have eminent architect, eminent uh, uh, surgeon, uh, people from SME background like myself, lawyers, doctors, barristers. So it has got the specialty. It has worked very well for the last many, many years, you know. Um, and we scrutinize every law that comes from the commons, you know. 
uh, commons don't sometimes like us because we make amendments to the legislation that were passed or passing, you know. So I don't think it should be abolished, but I agree with you one thing, Lalit, we must reform it, it's out of date, it's too many, we are 800 of us, we can do it smaller, the size of 400. And this peerage is given for life. I think we should limit in either five or 10 years. I don't believe we should have elected House of Lords. It doesn't serve the purpose because, you know, like your local member of parliament is your MP. And then you're a local member of House of Lords. Who do you go to? You confuse people. And what we need is a country. In fact, every country needs that in our democracy, that we need expertise to help us to do this legislation correctly, you know, to make it um, uh, effective. So I think we should reform it. Yes, I agree with you. We should have a smaller house. We shouldn't have elected house. And maybe the best way I my thought on that is um, have a limited period of five, maybe 10 years, and we select them, but not elect them. And the way we select, not through prime minister or cabinet office, I think we should do a selection from the Institute, Institute of Child Accountants, Child Surveys, the British Medical Association. So let them nominate one of their members for five or 10 years to represent their organization, the House of Lords, to help revise the bills that's going through in the areas that they're good at. Yeah, apologies for asking. However, this was something that came up in the media some time ago. So I totally agree with you, a reform rather than abolishing, correct? Correct. Absolutely. A, a, a reform is more important, yes. Yes, yes. Thank you for answering that question. We have a few minutes left, but you know, there are some burning questions that the Lohana community have also sent from Nairobi. So if viewers, if uh, um, Lord Popot, is it okay if we go about 10 minutes over time? Fine, that's perfect. Yeah, so we just may want to make sure there are some questions coming up on the chat box and also some questions still remaining to answer. So if that's okay, we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes extra on this particular session. So sure. bear with us. <clears throat> we do not want to let go of you. We want this information from you. So we're being a bit selfish about it, but we want to make sure we get everything. I'll, I'll be short and fast so that more questions can come. Sure. Thank you very much. Now, one of your greatest political achievements has been increasing the British Indian vote for the Conservative Party. This was invaluable to David Cameron's victory in 2010 and 2015. How did you achieve this? What I'll do, I'll, I'll fast track all the answers. It, it, India is normally voted for the Labour Party. Our values are very conservative, hard work, education, enterprise, I want to repeat all that. And it was educating the British Indian community why we should vote conservative, but most important, educating conservative party that our values are similar to yours. Look at us, how well we've done, we work hard, we don't live on welfare, and, and the combination of that. But I think I'll give credit to David Cameron, who, who was very progressive um, and reformed the party so well uh, and encouraged uh, people from ethnic minority to stand as, as candidates. In fact, um, in 20, 2005, there were two conservatives and MPs from ethnic minority. By 2015, there were 17. In 2005, we didn't have a single uh, cabinet ministry from ethnic minority. Today, we've got four. Great growth. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Moving on to the next one. You have motivated, encouraged, and inspired a lot of young Lohanas and British Indians to join politics and civic duty. What inspired you to do this? I think mainly I saw, it's just not the Lohanas, it's the British Indian community as a whole. Um, we are shy of politics, we are shy of getting into um, civic duty, and I do admire the Muslim community in that respect a lot more than the Hindu community. They come forward, <clears throat> we don't come forward, and you see a large number of mayors and councils now run by the Muslim community, so you have to do credit to them. So I'm telling to British Indian to please come forward come and do the civic duty. Let's have a school governor, let's have a councillor, let's have a member of parliament. Uh, you know, um, I, I, we are very intelligent, we are very clever, we are very patriotic about this great country and we can make a huge difference. And I'm pleased to say now that we're getting more British Indians uh, coming forward. You spoke to my um, parliamentary aide, Amit Jogi, a few minutes ago, who has been a councillor for over 10 years and many, many others, Minal Sashtel is there, Abhishek Sashtel, and many new ones, which is Sonak is now a member of parliament and a cabinet minister. So they're now coming forward, which is good news. 
and more to come. And more to come, of course. Yes. Thank you. One more question is, your debate on anti-Semitism was widely received by the Jewish community all across the world, from the United Kingdom to Israel, to United States of America, and even in India. You became a champion, a rock star within the Jewish community. <clears throat> what impelled you to get involved with the Jewish, uh, get involved in the Jewish issue? After all, you're not a Jewish man. Correct. In fact, uh, I funny I, you say that, but I started with the debate in the House of Lords that uh, why me? Why have I brought up on myself to bring this debate into your Lordship's house? After all, I'm not Jewish. Why should anti Semitism concern me? But the notion that it is only a Jewish problem is both wrong and dangerous. Like it, it is them today, it could be us tomorrow. Um, you know what prejudice can bring. And we live in a very diverse country and we celebrate that diversity so well. I don't want any community to be prejudiced by, you know, the British people. So I brought this debate for government to take action. And remember today is Jewish, tomorrow it could be us. And if I finally say one thing, and I'm sure Amesh Bakhagran will remember that, that when Idi Amin kicked out the Ugandan nations in August, 1972, prior to that, with the help of Colonel Gaddafi, he kicked out the Jewish. That's true, absolutely true. And on the on the point of discrimination, we had a question that came up on the chat box by a lovely Kenyan lady, Juliet Matithilia, and she says, how can we protect the Bain community from discrimination in the United Kingdom? Would there be some kind of a, a light you can throw on that? Well, we are a free, free country and we are there to protect everybody, every ethnicity. We have legislation in place. Uh, most of this legislation, again, were brought by the Jewish parliamentarians. So, of course, we want to protect them. We make, want to make sure that they're safe and well and make sure that they feel that they're living in a great country and have a sense of belonging. Thank you for answering that. Now, some of the last few questions, and these are very much in uh, conjunction with the Lohana Youth League from Nairobi, Trishula and uh, Deep, Deep. I hope you guys are all <coughs> taking some notes to these ones. So here, um, the community is asking advice for young budding Lohanas. Give us some three tips, any thoughts on challenges that we're facing and the three tips on how we can handle them. Wow, it's a very important and interesting question. In fact, yes. um, I've always believed now we live 80, 100 years, we live longer life thanks to modern um, healthcare. But I would say our first 20 years, Lalit, is of learning from our primary school to secondary school to, to university. Our second 20 years is earning. So learning comes first, earning comes second. And our third 20 years is putting in. And our four 20 years, this is when we get older, uh, is taking out, well, partly. And with this in mind, I'll recommend the following three tips for the young Lohanas. Firstly, the privileged have responsibility to society. Philanthropy is therefore important. Now, philanthropy doesn't mean just giving your money out, but giving your time. Second, always focus on hard work, education, I'll, repeat, I'll say this a few times, family and faith. Both family and faith are uh, are very important as you get older. Family is key. In fact, that uh, oneness of family and working together with family is very, very important. And, and, and I would say, live within your means and make sure you respect your elders. Elderly are, are a treasure, crow, experience and wisdom. Spend time with them. It's not what you do now. Always maintain the dignity, give them respect, and treat them the love and understanding, no matter what the circumstances. Now, this final paragraph I read from the, the report, the aging population, one of the uh, person we took evidence from gave us this little paragraph. And um, I genuinely believe this is very important for young generation. Thank you very much. Those were amazing three tips, responsibility <clears throat> to the society, hard work, education, have family and faith there, and respect your elders for the wisdom. Amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Deep and Trishula, hope you've had those notes taken there. 
And moving on to the question again from the Lahana Youth League, uh, what keeps you up at night and how do you handle the stress? Well, I think I enjoy in, in doing what I do. It is it, the job satisfaction is very important. Uh, and, um, you know, it's my DNA to work hard. And so the community and the country. So uh, what makes me happy is the outcomes of that, what I do. And I see the fact of that. I mean, this report took me a long time, but I must have received over a thousand compliments and people said they've learned a lot. Many young people said they've learned a lot how to treat our parents, our elderly parents. Many elderly said, oh, this report is good. I know what to do with my life. So all these things keeps me awake and makes me very happy in what I do. Sure. And the, the, that's, that's truly amazing. And the next question in very similar lines is, mm -hmm. how do you execute your ideas? And above all, you have tons of things on your shoulders that you're dealing with. How do you manage your time? I, I actually, I, I wake up very early, five o'clock and go through my emails and do my reading, uh, my research. I've got lovely staff as well who are you know, normally Amit is the first one to come at home about 9.30ish. We have breakfast together. And um, a lot of his delegation, a lot of his doing to yourself. Um, but to, to have a break, I quite often, four o'clock, I tee off. The next time I'm teeing off is after I finish this meeting with you. So I, I find that playing golf in a very good environment, nice greenery, fresh air, makes all the difference. I come back home about 8ish on my dinner. So... I manage it very well, luckily, and um, people can be demanding, of course, sometimes. You know, lately with COVID-19, we had large number of people stuck in India to make sure that they came here safely. So you get issues and problems on a daily basis which you have to address. Moving on to the same question uh, with, with COVID-19 and how you're doing all this, that uh, the question comes from the Youth League again, that we are in a long global downturn economically. Ways to maneuver it, what impact it will have for developing African economies and the rebound of it. I know it's a vast question, but if you may, in, in a couple of minutes, be able to sure. address that issue. <clears throat> this is, in fact, as I say, the dust will hit the fan. This is just not yet started. It is going to be worse than recession, um, you know, a depression. And it could be universal throughout the world. And we need to address it. it is, there's be different challenges for most leaders of every nation. So it's not going to be easy, but I've covered most of the answers on this question in the beginning anyway, when we talk about COVID-19, the effect on the economy. In Africa, it's even going to be worse. As I said, Africa relies on three major income, the remittance they get from US and UK, where the people unemployed can't send the money back home. Of course, uh, the exports and fruit and veg and minerals and others is going to be affected. What's most important, Kenya, as I said earlier, relies on tourism. A third of the economy is tourism. Uh, they get about 1.25 billion, about 2 million people visiting Kenya on a regular basis. All this is going to be hit. And um, COVID-19 is a very dangerous virus. It's really costed many lives. It's, it's going to cost many lives, I'm afraid to say. And we just keep our fingers crossed. Um, let's show that love and express and feelings for fellow human beings. Uh, we look after each other and let's hope for the best. Absolutely. And let's have the faith that this will take us through to a better world out there. Um, moving on to a couple of my personal questions I'm going to ask you. I know you've addressed this, but one more time. What yeah. is it that inspires you to be who you are? Well, I think what inspires me to be who I am, and as I said, I... Gujarati Makauta Amari Okadnathi, Imari Kudrati, Mara Guru Nikupa, Odilo Nikupa, may I mention a few names, Manuba and Gohil, Mara Mabap Nikupa, Ashe Bagwani Kupa, who are situation at Chune Maria, Ferret Cheki, Ama with Chamber name, Fine Sebakaru, Sarukaru, and a Nathineke Mansuni Sebakaru. That's a great inspiration itself. Very, very humble, very kind, and very generous of you. And you. moving on to that, you mentioned earlier, Lord Poppet, your guru's kripa. So uh, if we can find out who is your guru? 
Or oh, my guru for last 30 years has been um, Morari Bapu. Bapu is a great inspiration to me. He's, um, he's amazing. I listen to him on a regular basis. Uh, I go to his recitals. That's my holidays only, twice, few times a year. We ourselves had a recital in London in 1998. Um, our family, friends, and had recitals. Um, our mama, Ramesh Pai, and Pratibha Ben Sashdev had two recitals in London as well. My son, Rupin, had a one in Vatican, um, where normally they don't allow non-Catholic organization to come, Bapu's Katha, so we had nine days there. Last year we had in Athens, and this year it was meant to be at Cambridge University, Bapu Nikatha. Cambridge, Bapu Bapuchin, a Cambridge exam, Tranwaf Paykas. Allow me to go Cambridge, my Rakia, Kadach, Cambridge, both university and a certificate, rapidly in a past good year. But Cambridge Makathati, because of COVID-19, has been cancelled for next year now. But Bapu has been a great inspiration. We do share, you know, when I say about 20 years of learning, 20 years of earning, after 40, 45, always have a spiritual, I'm not saying religious, but spiritual guru. And sometimes listening to him gives you good guidance to your next 20, 30 years. That's very, very nice of you to say that, Lord Papat, as the Google map, would guide you to your destination. They say guru is your Google to your spiritual path. Correct. So one should definitely have a spiritual guru. Um, moving on uh, to the last question from us. And then I have a short <clears throat> game that I would like to play with yourself and let the audience uh, hear that. So the last question is, you, you mentioned your son, you mentioned your daughter-in-law. Tell us in just a short while, your family. Baby Sandhya Ben, and who else is in your family? Well, I've got two, three sisters and um, uh, three brothers. One of them lives in Vancouver, Manoj, who's older than me. Two younger brothers, Kanthesh and Pankaj, lives not far from where I live. Yes. Um, um, and I've got three sons, Rupin, who's married to Rupa, the oldest one. Um, Pawan, who they all live nearby. And she won the youngest one who got engaged, was supposed to get married in October, but obviously we postponed the wedding until next year. So it's a small family, but um, we have many relations, friends who are like families to us. Amit is my great son. He's my family for many years. He's with me most of the time. Um, he's married to Priya, my friend's daughter, um, Deepak Chaitanya, the ex-president of Lohana Community, North, uh, North London. So that's my family, you know. Amazing. And we had a grandchild, Jayani, you know, who is um, six months old, so eight months old, you know. Congratulations on that, and thank you very much. The last little couple minutes we are going to spend is I'm going to say a word, and you respond by one word, <clears throat> if that's okay. Sure. Britain. Great. Boris Johnson. Amazing. Rishi Sunak. Next Prime Minister. COVID-19. Dangerous. Politics. Lovely. Murari Bapu. Superb. Brexit. Great. The British subject. Proud to be. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was a quick fire round. Lovely it all. Lord Poppet, thank you so much for being with us. We are going to complete the formalities by the, the Lohana Youth League thanking you. But from myself, Mina Ben, absolutely an amazing seminar. We have had nothing but positive feedback on the chat box. We salute to you as a Lohana, as a Gujarati, as a Hindu, being in a British community and standing so strong. So thank you for being that for us, being an inspiration for us. And we thank those parents who had a child like you. So you. once again, Lord Papa, thank you very much for, for the Zoom session. I'm going to actually now go over to Trishila. Trishila, who is the secretary for uh, the Lohana uh, Youth League in uh, Nairobi, and she is a super lawyer working in the corporate m and and a private equity practice group at the DLA Piper Africa, IKM Advocates.
She has completed her undergraduate degree in LLB from the University of Kent in the United Kingdom, a postgraduate diploma in the legal practice. The legal practice course at the BPP University College in London and a postgraduate degree being an LLM, Masters of Law, specializing in the international commercial law at City University. Once again, a super personality, Trishula Devani, the Secretary of Lohana Youth League. <coughs> Thank you for coming Thank on you. to this Zoom session. Thanks. Thank you, Lalit Bhai, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, and good evening to everyone who's logged into the session today. Um, I'd like to start off by extending a very big thank you to Lord Dollar Poppet, um, our speaker for this evening. Um, uh, and I do this on behalf of the entire Lohana Youth League team here in Nairobi, um, as well as Mina Ben uh, Kagram and Dr. Um, you know, Dr. Serda, and of course, Ellie, our co-host. Um, you know, we've been through a vast number of subjects on this on this call today, Lord Poppet, um, and we've managed to hear your thoughts on all of these. And I'd really like to thank you for taking your time out to to join us on this session, on this session in particular, because I, you know we've 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 got an insight into all of these lovely, very informative thoughts, um, and it's it's very important from a youth perspective because yours has been such an inspirational journey. So thank you very much. Um, as the saying goes, a person is best known by the impact they have on the lives of others and your impact has certain, certainly been very, very great. Um, Mina Anti Kagram, um, Lalit Pai Serda, Eli, like I mentioned, thank you for bringing us this wonderful initiative on, an, on a weekly basis. Very informative. You give us information on our fingertips, literally. Um, so, so nice to be a part of these. Um, and thank you for collaborating uh, with the Lohana Youth League team in Nairobi. Um, I would also like to extend a big thank you to our committee, the Lohana Youth League Committee, for their support as always. The Lohana Majan Mandal as well, and our sister institutions as well here in Nairobi. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're very grateful for the support. Um, I'd like to thank the participants on a passing note for joining the session. I'm sure you found it very useful, very informative. Um, and, you know, it was just the tip of the iceberg, but such an informative session. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Lalit Bai for his parting comments. Thank you very much, Trishula. Really, really appreciate that. Now, as uh, I just wanted to mention Ellie, Ellie, uh, uh, Lord Poppet, the way uh, Amit Jogia is absolutely a huge support with you and working hand in hand. This yeah. is Nina Benz Ali, who is working yeah. as a co-host, not only as a co-host, but he is a super gentleman at the side of Mina Ben at all times. So Ali deserves a huge round of applause, Ali. Thank you very much for that. Okay, now lovely. Then we will formally end this program today by Mina Ben actually saying her final thank you. She's a humble lady, a clear at heart lady, and she just says her words as she means them. So we'll have a word of thanks from Mina Ben to all the Zoom participants and to Lord Papa. Thank you, Lalit. On behalf of Lalit Pai and myself, I want to thank you all but I really, really don't want to end this session. So much to learn. God, both of you are so good. I'm like this. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Lohana Youth League. Weren't you happy to see our daughter and son giving so good, um, like, I mean, speeches. Trishala, you are the best. Thank you, Lord Dollar Poppet. Uh, I would say again, Suno Lankesh, Sakaliguna Tore, Take Tum, Atishaya Priyam Mori. Bapuna Shabdache, Mare Nitamari, Ekaj Kahani Che, Pakka Vishno Majanum, Pakka Marjadi. We, I follow his Ajay Sharutaiche Bapu Nikatha, and he is really, really amazing person. I like your words. I'm simple. Maravadilna Ashivat, and he's showing so much gratitude to people who have put you up. Dollar by another thing I want to tell you I can't see you, but I think. You will blush a little bit. Dollar Bhai, you look stunning with your suit and pink shirt. <laughs> Do come to Nakuru. 
make a point and try to help our youth as well and anywhere i can be help to you from home thank you everybody again thank you for coming kwaheri no topic no topic thank you very very I, much for this uh, and any final words you want to 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 share with us and then we can end this uh, zoom <clears> session <throat> Now, I just want to thank you, Lalit, Mina, Ben, Ramesh, Payat, Rashila, and Ili, you know, Ali, who has been co-host of this program. And thank you to all the listeners. And as I said earlier, if anybody wants a hard copy of the book or the report, uh, either the email you, Mina, Ben, or us, we'd be very happy to post it, no matter where it is in the world. And thank you for the generosity. So anybody who's listening to this Zoom session, please contact uh, us uh, either via messages or Facebook or personal contact. And we'll make sure that Lord Popper gets this message and the books and the report will be sent to you. Thank you very much. And a big thank you to Amit for being a great assistance to me too. Amit, thank you very much. Lord Popper, thank you. And I'm sure we'll connect again um, soon. Have a lovely afternoon and a good day, good evening to all the viewers. Thank you very much. Thanks.